Hello, I'm JW. Uh, this time we're going to look at that twin and earth uh, cabling again. And I've got a piece here, and we're going to see how you can actually strip this and uh, the sort of ways you might actually install it. Now this is the uh, twin and earth cable, and it's probably the most common type that's used uh, for wiring in the UK, mainly because it's fairly cheap and it's fairly easy to use as well. And uh, this particular one is uh, 2.5 square millimetre, and as we saw on the producer video, that's actually the cross-sectional area of the conductors. So this one has the blue and brown covering, and then the earth in the centre is uncovered. Now there's various ways to actually strip this, and uh, one of them is to take a knife uh, such as this one and to uh, score down the centre like that. And when you get to the end, you can actually just cut in slightly deeper there. And notice I haven't actually gone all the way through here. It's just purely scoring it, and then we can actually open it up. And as you can see, it will just peel down along where we scored previously to whatever length we would like. And you notice this one has this uh, white powder inside, which is some kind of talc, and that's primarily there so that the covering doesn't actually stick to the inner insulation. There have been certain cables like this which have been made incorrectly, and they forgot to put that in. Uh, what happens there is you uh, install it in the building, and then when you come back to uh, fix up all the ends, you find that you can't actually detach the grey covering from the inside insulation, and it basically tears and makes a horrible mess, and it takes weeks to uh, sort out. And of course, by that time, you've already fitted it in the building. So if you get a new roll of this, it's always worth just uh, splitting the end open and just checking that the actual stuff inside can be easily cut. Much easier to do it before, rather than after you've say, stored hundreds of metres of it in somebody's building. Now, at this piece here, there's various ways of cutting this off. The way to avoid damaging it is just to cut it here, and therefore you're not actually uh, damaging the inside insulation. Now, in the previous video, we had some which had nice uh, cut ends, and uh, the way that that is achieved is to, again, if we just uh, cut another piece as if it was the start of it. And then here, where we've got the uh, section we want, it's to score the outer covering on both sides, but crucially not actually go all the way through the insulation, because that could obviously damage the inner conductors. Pull it down to a point there, and then you should be able to just tear that away, leaving that uh, flat, very tidy end. Now, of course, in reality, uh, that's not desperately necessary. The fact that the end might be a bit raggedy is not going to actually affect anybody. But, uh, say, so you can do that if you want. But, say, so the risk is that if you can actually cut in too deeply and then end up damaging the inner insulation. So, generally, it's just quick to, uh, say, bend them one way and then just trim off the back with the knife. Now, when you've actually got this stuff uh, exposed, then it's just a matter of stripping the ends to whatever length. So, so we just cut these to a... Uh, sensible length here, and you can either use cutters like this with the predefined holes, or there's various sort of automatic ones which uh, grip over the end, but uh, in this case just a matter of uh, stripping the ends away like that. That gives you a reasonably clean end. You can also use a knife just to uh, go around there and then trim away. That tends to give a bit of a more uh, raggedy edge there, and it also takes longer, but nevertheless you can uh, use the knife. So those are now ready to attach to whatever terminals you happen to have. And again, just trim that to uh, appropriate length so you don't have the bare copper showing once it's in a terminal. Now the uh, centre conductor here is the earth or the circuit protective conductor, and this is actually bare, but uh, before attaching it to any kind of equipment, it's necessary to apply sleeving. And the uh, sleeving in this case is this stuff, which is green and yellow. And that just slides over the top. And then you would also just cut that to an appropriate length. So then you've got the same amount of copper showing at the end. So uh, it's all covered up there, and it's, uh, it's green and yellow uh, stripe there. And it's there primarily to identify it as the protective conductor, and also to cover up all of this bare copper, because bearing in mind if you're going to put this behind a uh, socket or something, once you've uh, put all the wires in, they're all bent round in the back, then it's not beyond possibility if this will bare that it could uh, sort of bend round and short onto some other conductor. But Nevertheless, that's how it's done. It's not included on the wire because, of course, it's cheaper not to bother and just uh, put these bits of sleeving over the end. But, uh, of course, it would be better if it was available with uh, all three with the insulation. And, of course, that would cost more and nobody would buy it. They'd just buy this because it was cheaper. 
Now another method of stripping this uh, is to cut down the center with some uh, cutters. And then you can gradually peel the outer covering away. And of course you can carry on down there as long as you want. And that's a bit time consuming because of course you've got to uh, sort of nibble all the way down. And again there is that risk of uh, damaging the inner conductors. And another way to do it is to expose the end there so you've got a little bit of the center conductor showing. Take some uh, pliers here and then basically use that to pull away the outer insulation, cutting through it, and then you can just peel away the outer covering, and again then just trim away the uh, insulation like that. Now this may have uh, one disadvantage in that it does leave a rather raggedy end. There's also a complete myth about uh, if you pull on this wire it's somehow going to stretch it, and that's clearly impossible because uh, to actually stretch copper of this dimension you're going to have to apply a force of hundreds of kilograms at the very least and possibly even thousands, far more than you're going to be able to do with your hand. So this myth about uh, pulling this and it's being stretched simply doesn't happen. Any stretching is uh, fractions of a millimetre. It's not going to make the slightest difference to anything. So even if you get on this and uh, wrench it with as much force as possible it's not going to stretch. What may well happen though is that if you pull on this too hard and you've got a fairly short length of cable that you actually pull this and it uh, basically pulls along the cable so when you get to the other end it's obviously short but the myth about doing that and it's stretching is exactly that, it's just a myth. It simply uh, does not stretch, simply the fact that uh, to uh, say stretch copper of this type it's clearly uh, massive amounts of force but uh, say it just doesn't happen in reality. Uh, another potential issue though is that if you if you bend this too many times then it will actually harden the metal and then make it brittle. Again if you're only doing it one time like that well again it's not going to make a, a huge difference but uh, if you took hold of it and then uh, bend it many times then eventually the metal will fatigue and eventually will break off. But clearly it's all there, it's not just uh, once or twice, it's uh, many many times of bending. So again in reality that's not uh, likely to be a major problem unless you're going to go at it like that. But nevertheless you can uh, strip it in that fashion if you want. And Again then it's just trim the ends as appropriate to uh, fit it into whatever fixings you're going to use it with. Now in terms of actually attaching this to a wall or whatever you can just actually fix this directly on the surface or uh, surface clipped and then you would use uh, clips of this sort of style to attach that so it simply just fits over the cable and is then hammered through into position and uh, that's fine as long as the uh, environment is going to be installed in is not somewhere it's likely to be actually damaged so say it was some of the house or something that wouldn't be uh, too bad although most people wouldn't want that on the wall but clearly if it was in some place where there's like uh, like a garage or something where objects may well fall against it probably not very appropriate because of course the outer covering is fairly soft and can be damaged but if it's somewhere it's not going to get damaged or uh, hit with anything and so you can just uh, clip that in place with clips of this style. Let just fit over like that. This is actually a large one, but uh, let's just clip over like that. And uh, if it's not going to be, uh, again, in an area that's going to be too damaged, that's perfectly fine. But uh, another possible option is to use stuff like this, which is a uh, sort of miniature plastic trunking. Just has a removable lid there. This one's also sewed adhesive, so it's just a question of uh, peeling the back off, sticking it to the uh, wall or whatever you've got and then the cable just fits inside and then you have your plastic lid which will just clip over the top to cover over and again you can get this in various sizes this is a fairly small size just for one individual cable but again bigger sizes can be had and let's say this is self-adhesive you can get types which are not and even if it is you may want to put a few screws through just to ensure it's not going to come away from the wall so that's sort of the options if you're going to be attaching it to the surface. At one time you could also get uh, little clips which uh, were basically metal which you just nailed into the surface then it uh, just folded around on the top and the bottom there. They're not particularly common now but uh, mainly because they're quite time consuming to use and it's just easier to use the hammer in variety of the plastic one we just saw. Now in terms of putting this stuff uh, in the wall which is uh, by far the most common option because most people don't want to see cables on the surface particularly in their house then again you've got a few options. Uh, you can cut a channel into the wall and you can actually place this stuff directly in the channel and then plaster it directly over it. It's not necessary to have any additional kind of covering over this stuff. And so you can just place it in and cover over with plaster. 
However, if you didn't want to do that, you can also get, uh, again, plastic uh, material like this, which is generally oval in shape, and just thread that over the cable first if you want to. Again, you don't have to use that, but you can if you would like. In theory, that may offer a bit of protection when you're plastering it, but you have like a sharp edge of a trowel or something, but uh, in reality, if you're that careless, then uh, you shouldn't be uh, using such tools in the first place. But again, there's no problem in, say, putting this directly in the wall, or indeed just to say uh, clipping it to the wall and then putting plasterboard or something over the top. And again, you could use sort of round conduit if you wanted to, though that's normally for single wiring, but again, it's not an issue. And you can also get what's called capping, which is essentially the same uh, plastic material as this, except it's uh, placed the cable on the actual wall, and then the cabin it just sits over the top, secured with a couple of nails either side. And again, that's purely there to hold the cable in place. It doesn't add any kind of protection, because bearing in mind it's only made out of this thin white plastic, so uh, if someone's going to drill through it, well, of course the drill's going to go straight through. You can also get steel capping, which is generally galvanised, and again, that's just put the cable on and the capping just sits over the top. A few nails to fix in place. And again, as before, it's just there to hold the cable in position. It doesn't offer any particular protection, because again, it's so thin you can nail through it to fix it. So if you're going to nail into the wall or put a drill there, again, it's going to go straight through and right into the cable anyhow. But again, you can use that if you want to. But uh, say, direct in the wall or in plastic conduit or with capping or whatever, or doesn't really matter. Now, when it comes to actually attaching it into a socket or something else, uh, if it's going to be on the surface, then you're probably going to use something along the lines of this. This is a surface mounted box, and this is double one way to have your double socket outlet. And these are made of uh, hard molded plastic, and again it's basically screw these to the wall surface, and then the cable can enter in any one of the cutouts around the edge. So if you wanted to say coming at the bottom here, we just take pliers, just go in there, and just break that section out. Just square that up a bit. Tied it up the knife a bit there. And then once that's fixed to the wall, then it's a question of the wires will be uh, threaded through. Generally, you'll do this before preparing the ends, but uh, push them like that. And again, the wire would either be in the uh, plastic trunking that we saw earlier, and you can have that sort of running right up to the fitting like that so the cable is concealed. Or again, you just clip it straight to the wall if you want it. Uh, the important thing is to make sure that the grey covering actually is inside of the enclosure. What you don't want is to have something like this, where your wires expose outside, because that's only a single insulation. So it is important that you have the grey covering actually within the box like that. And again, this cable should be fixed uh, either on the uh, trunking or on the surface or whatever, to make sure it doesn't actually move or pull out. And once in the box, again, it's just a question of connecting these to the socket or whatever else you've got in there. So that's for surface uh, fixings. If you want things to be flush in the wall, which is probably by far the most common option, then it'll be a box similar to this. Now these are made of metal, it's galvanised steel, and this is the sort of thing you'd actually recess flat into the wall. So you'd uh, cut out a hole in the wall of this thickness, whether that's in the bricks or uh, whatever else you've got, and arrange it so that this face was therefore flush with the front of the wall. So all you would see on the wall is the basically recess like that. And in that case, of course, the cable would also be recessed and sunken into the wall. Now these come with various uh, partially cut holes on all of the sides and on the back as well, so just a question of using the which one was appropriate. And say in this case we're going at the bottom, so it's a question of taking some uh, heavy tool and then just uh, punching through the appropriate hole. And there's a tab there which holds it in place, so again, just bend that a few times to break that piece out. And because this is metal, of course, that's now left a nice sharp edge where you could slash the cable and cause it to be damaged. So what you need is one of these, which is a PVC grommet. And again, that just presses in there. It's got a little groove around the edge. So that will just press into the hole. And now you can press the cable through without it obviously damaging and destroying the edge of it. So again, the cable will just come through there. And as with the plastic one, uh, though this is in the wall, you do need to make sure that the grey covering is within the box and certainly not with the uh, wire sort of hanging down, because even though it's in the wall, these things do need to be contained within the box that you're using. And after the other one, you'd normally put the uh, wires in first and then strip the ends afterwards once you have the wall plastered and fixed up. And then again, it's just a question of attaching the wires to the socket or whatever other thing you've got.
And if you're doing a circuit with uh, more than one socket on, then uh, you would typically take out more than one hole, so you'd have obviously more than one cable coming in. These are 20 millimeter holes. You can, in theory, get two of these uh, cables through there. For example, those two will fit. But two really is about the maximum. You're not going to want to get more than two in there. And in many cases, it's easier to actually put two holes in, because then when you're inside the box, you don't have this uh, huge fat section of cable here, which may get in the way of certain types of sockets. So if you put one in, it's easy to get it to the back of the box like that. And then the same would be on this side. So generally, it's easy to put two holes. But uh, if there's only one, say, you can normally get two cables through the one hole. And of course, you can come in through the back if you wanted to, depending on where the cables and things are actually in the building. And if you're putting a lot of these in, say to a whole house or something, once you've cobbled a load of these and collected them up, you can leave them on the floor so that any children in the area think they've found a load of money on the floor. But of course, in reality, it's just a worthless disc of metal. So that's Twin and Earth. And I say it's a fairly common type of cabling, and it's certainly the cheapest and therefore probably the most widely used. And a few things to note about this is it's not suitable really for use outside. Uh, this covering is not generally uh, UV stable, so if you leave it outside in the full sun, then it tends to uh, deteriorate and crack and uh, fall apart after a few years. So not the sort of thing you want to be using outside. And the other aspect as well is that uh, being outside, it's far more likely to be damaged by uh, things falling against it or whatever. Foxes coming along and chewing it and things. So not suitable for use outside on its own. But again, if you wanted to use, say, some of this stuff, then again, that's perfectly fine for using outside. As though this is uh, PVC plastic as well, it's of the kind that uh, is far more rigid and of course it's much more durable in terms of things falling against it or the sunlight affecting it. So we can use outside but uh, certainly not uh, something you want to just stick on the wall on its own. And the other way to be careful as well is like things like a conservatory or a porch or something. Whereas though even if you're inside, if it's going to be in full sun all the time, again you don't really want that in that situation. And this is not suitable for use underground either, because of course there's no protection. Someone just puts a spade into the ground, it's going to go straight through the side of it. And of course this outer covering is there fairly soft and quite easily damaged. And again, they've got the pieces here, you see they're very flexible and of course uh, no problem in there. Even a moderately sharp object just causing fairly significant damage to the surface quite quickly. So not suitable for use outside, but again for internal wiring, pretty much the uh, standard sort of thing in homes and uh, smaller installations. So let's look at twin and earth cabling and how to uh, prepare the ends. So quite straightforward, there's not really much you can uh, get wrong with it. The main thing is to ensure you're not uh, slicing into the inner insulation if you're going to cut down the middle. And where you cut it off here again, make sure you're not actually cutting into the insulation as that could, could easily cause a fault there. But uh, other than that, fairly straightforward and uh, simple to use. And so when you cut the ends of the uh, insulation here, you want to make sure that the length is appropriate for the terminal it's going into. You don't want to have any copper sort of hanging out the back of the terminal on the socket or whatever. It needs to go in there and be completely covered. And another annoying thing that some people have done is on a lighting circuit where you may have a plastic box, say such as the uh, one we saw here, and a plastic switch on the front, then it won't have any specific earth connection. What uh, some foolish persons tend to do is to cut off the earth wire here and just leave it because that's hopeless. But then when you come along later to fit a metal switch, you can't use it. So in the event of the earth wire not being required, still put the sleeving on and then just put a separate connector block on the end there so it's uh, safely covered. Then of course it's available for someone in the future who may wish to attach a switch that has an earth connection on it. And of course that doesn't happen with sockets because they will have an earth connection anyhow, but uh, certainly uh, just cutting it off because you couldn't be bothered to put a connection on the end, absolutely ridiculous, and just makes a whole load of work and bother for somebody in the future. And you might think, well, so what? But uh, at some point, that person in the future is going to be you. So if you cut it off and then come back to it later, or even once that someone else did, well, you'll be uh, cursing them because you now have to start digging out the wall and uh, digging around to find the earth wire that some buffoon chopped off a considerable time ago. So uh, that's twin earth cabling. Uh, future videos, we'll have a look at the actual circuits you can uh, use that with. But uh, for the moment, thanks for watching.